Hello, good evening, and welcome. I'm John Lazarus with Stories Matter and Danny Publishing. Luke Skywalker, Atticus Finch, Death Wishes Paul Kersey, all classic examples of archetypal heroes, paragons of virtue whose actions could never be construed as anything other than good. A lot of us think of ourselves as heroes, or at least as good people whose example others should follow. I know I do, which is mostly why I created this YouTube channel. Well, that and my nephew said I could make more money doing this than selling books out of the trunk of my car. But when I take a step back and think about it, I realize there are certain aspects of myself that aren't heroic at all. I don't talk to my children if I don't have to, for example. And I've cheated on every wife I've ever had. And if I get poor service at a restaurant, I always make sure to leave them an upper decker as punishment. I'm sure you've all done things like this. In real life, most of us fall in the middle ground between virtuous heroism and outright villainy. In fiction, we call people like these anti-heroes. We'll explore how to write a character who saves an orphanage, but also keys cars for, like, no reason, on this edition of Stories Matter. Today's video is brought to you by Ecovax Winbot Window Cleaning Robot. If you're anything like me, you'll live in an apartment where the windows get their fair share of rough treatment. From neighborhood kids egging them, to exhaust from EPA violating engines staining them, to chicken, duck, and goose viscera from Saturday farmers' wet markets spattering them, my windows take a beating. What's the solution? Well, you could awkwardly stick your hand outside and squeeze them once a week, but that's just a sprained wrist waiting to happen. Avoid costly medical bills by purchasing the WinBot 1. With just a two-hour charging time, its state-of-the-art dual cross-spray technology will keep almost any kind of glass spotless. Call Ecovacs today for more information. Before we start, it's important we have a clear definition of what an anti-hero actually is. To do that, we need to understand the difference between traditional heroes and anti-heroes. It turns out my publishing company has two perfect examples. The traditional hero of d and &E Publishing would be Devin Harper, my former business partner who started the company with me in 2012. Like uh, most traditional heroes, he was humble, upstanding, and selfless. He was humble because he said he didn't want his name on any of our paperwork. He was upstanding because he was against moving our company to a part of town the police avoided. And he was selfless because he sacrificed his life to rescue our secretary after a fire caused by siphoning electricity from another building burned ours down. The anti-hero of d &E Publishing would be my former agent and another business partner, Jeffrey Collins, who was self-important, rebellious, and selfish. Jeffrey was self-important because he insisted we use his and Devin's names for our company, even though I said there already was a publishing company called that. He was rebellious because he wanted to publish books that other companies wouldn't. He was selfish because he insisted we needed electricity more than the building next door. Your next question might be, what exactly is the difference then between an anti-hero and a villain? After all, that's what the judge in Jeffrey's arson case thought before pancreatic cancer got him first. The difference is anti-heroes need to be striving for goals that are virtuous. They must be motivated by something that is good. It can be a blurry line, both in fiction and in real life. But in Jeffrey's case, I know that despite his attitude and methods, he was really trying to push our company to the top and help make me famous. Now, we're going to look at three types of anti-heroes and how to write them. Number one, the sympathetic anti-hero. They kill, they maim, they gouge eyeballs and tear open nut sacks. But all this bloodshed comes from somewhere. These are the types of heroes whose trauma has turned them into killing machines. Maybe, like Wolverine, it's because people won't accept them because mutants are gross. Maybe, like Raskolnikov, we understand the pain of getting screwed over by a certain type of person. When you write this type of anti-hero, ask yourself, how has their past affected them? When I wrote The Ballad of Ralph Quaid, I explained the anti-hero's unpredictable and violent ways by establishing that he nearly died as a young man after swallowing a lot of gasoline accidentally during a publicity stunt for a morning radio show. Number two, the self-interested rogue. These are some of my favorite characters to write, the sarcastic, foul-mouthed, rude guys who play by their own rules and are always looking out for number one. Han Solo is probably the most famous example, but that's only because nobody bothered to read the second edition of Chair. These characters usually don't care which side or ideology they fight for, which makes them relatable. I mean, 
I'd fight for China or ISIS or 3-6 Mafia if they paid me enough, wouldn't you? The question we ask here is, how do we get them on our side? In my sci-fi thriller, Gage Symmetries, the heroes get the rogue Shelby Kensington on their side by gifting him a sex robot that's programmed to never not give consent. Number three, the unwilling outsider. Unlike our last two entries, these antiheroes don't like fighting or violence or drama. Rincewind from the Discworld series fits great here. These are people who you've kept captive in your narrative and who you won't let escape, which can be a great way to release stress if you have certain urges that the thickness of your apartment walls won't let you express. The question you need to ask here is, what life change does the character need to make? I based Storming the Gates of Heaven's Havana Ramirez after several of the workers at my publishing company. They often came to work two to three minutes late. They were perfectly content making minimum wage, and their social media posts never celebrated our publishing successes, at least from what I could tell, as many of them always posted in some language other than English. But unlike them, in the story I made Havana take action by having a drug cartel kill her whole family. Hannah also survived the fire in my story. That's all for today. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll leave you with this week's This Day in Literary History. See you on the next one.